everyone. My name is Pranathi. I'm a freshman studying data science and astrophysics. Very seldom does one come across someone who has successfully balanced parenthood, education, and running one's business. Today's speaker is a testament to the modern day power worker, a lady who co-founded a revolutionary fashion retail company from the chambers of our very own Haas Business School while finishing her MBA and tending to her newborn child. I'm glad to have the privilege to introduce Shilpa Shah today. Her prior experiences in interaction design and creating meaningful online experiences at Disney and Punchcat set the course for how she created her unique consumer experience in her company, Kuyana. With an unconventional value proposition of encour encouraging her customers to buy less clothes, she has been able to successfully run this profitable venture through multiple rounds of funding. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Ms. Shilpa Shah. Hi, everyone. Oh, there, the volume is up. Okay. Um, it's a real honor um, to be here at Berkeley. Um, I actually was here as an undergrad as well, so um, sat where many of you guys are sitting, not in such a nice building. Um, but we, um, I graduated as a computer science undergrad um, in 2000. So I was here as an undergrad from 1996 to 2000 and then actually returned to come to Haas Business School 10 years later in 2010. So um, of all the talks that I do, I always um, find the ones um, at Cal um, most dear to my heart because I, I know what it's like to be you guys and what a special place this is. So thanks for having me. Um, I thought it'd be really uh, a good way to start is to give you an overview of the company itself. I think um, a lot of times when people hear fashion brand, um, you know, retail brand, like you can have many different um, impressions of that. And so I wanted to start at the top and give you a really good sense of who we are, what we're trying to do, um, where we fit into the retail landscape, and um, what, what we've been really excited about accomplishing. Um, so to begin with, um, starting from the top always, uh, Kuyana means to love. Um, so for us, um, this company really was about that. It was about um, an opportunity that we saw in the marketplace in 2011, 2012, where there weren't really products that really had meaning for people. Um, people were inundated with stuff. Um, nobody really knew where it was made. Um, a lot of the story and the heritage um, was missing. Um, and so Carla and I, my co-founder, um, she and I saw this kind, of, this kind of gap in the marketplace where women um, would oftentimes, uh, you would hear them say, oh, I, I wish I bought two of something because they couldn't repeat buy a product that they loved. Or um, they would say that um, you know, there wasn't something that they would buy again because the quality had suffered. Um, so we just really, we really saw there was an opportunity to kind of make things differently. Um, and like good immigrant children, we always joke that um, Carla wanted to study fashion design and I wanted to be a graphic designer. So like good immigrant children, we studied computer science and math. Um, and so we took our analytical brains, combined it with our creative sensibility, um, and we set to solve that problem. Um, so what is Kuyana? Kuyana is a lifestyle brand um, founded on the desire to inspire fewer, better choices. So um, our tagline is fewer, better things. Um, it's about really buying what you need, um, buying what you love, making sure that it's made with love, made with integrity. Um, and it really is about these stylish pieces that really make women feel confident. And our, our goal and hope is that if a woman feels confident, she's unstoppable. She can accomplish anything she wants if she feels that she looks appropriate, she feels confident in and of herself. So our goal is to take out all the guesswork of making products, so making sure that everything we make has quality, heritage, integrity. Um, it's a timeless design, so something she can wear over and over again, so she can really lead her most intentional life. Um, our company started with a Panama hat. Um, my co-founder, Carla, grew up in Ecuador, and so she grew up seeing 
uh, the supply chain of craftsmen um, around the world, Ecuador being the first example, that really were being underserved, um, that many of their jobs are being transferred overseas. So many of these big luxury brands had abandoned these factories around the world. Um, and so she saw her own industry in her own country um, be abandoned, right? So these, these products that people spend eight hours a day making, weaving it from the inside out, um, these people were really struggling. And then she came to the US to go to Brown, and what she noticed that the same hats were being sold for over $100. Um, so there was a real inequity there, that these people weren't getting paid the money that they deserved. And then a lot of times there were copycats in the market made out of plastic, H&M, um, fast fashion, which is really in many ways destroying um, the climate, um, with fashion being the second biggest polluter um, in you know, after petroleum. So um, she saw this, this kind of gap that people, um, especially with the Panama hat, people don't even realize that it's made in Ecuador. Um, so this is how disconnected American consumers were with how products are made. Um, so our goal was to really to empower these craftsmen and deliver products that, that had love. So I just have a short video to give you a sense of our storytelling and how we, we actually sell products. Oh, I would have played from there too. <laughs> um, so um, I think that's really where um, it, it's a it's a journey that starts from how the product is made with intention, um, in how the craftsmanship is celebrated, and how um, these products actually um, are made by the human hand. And that's something that we really wanted to share with our consumer. Um, but it's not just about um, those fewer better things. It was also about creating a whole new uh, business model that really empowered our customers to get these products that they deserved at a price that they could find accessible. So in, um, in 2011, when we started our company, um, we, uh, we started going country by country to try to find these abandoned factories and making products from around the world. Um, we raised a series seed round in 2012. Um, and since then, we actually have raised um, up to our series C and now have, um, as of the end of April, have nine stores across the country. Um, a little bit about us. Um, this is me and Carla. Um, and, uh, Vicky thought it'd be really great for you guys to learn a little bit more about our journey. So um, just as two founders, um, we come, we kind of, we felt like we had pretty much every role in the company covered. Um, so Carla, 
She went to Brown. She did applied math. She got her business degree at Stanford. She worked at Goldman Sachs, worked at Apple. Um, my side, I went to Berkeley as an undergrad, did computer science. Um, as my lovely um, introducer was telling you guys, I uh, worked as an interaction designer for 10 years. So um, I've been obsessive about consumer experiences and user experience design since 2000 when um, that wasn't really even an industry. So I graduated at the top of the internet bubble um, when I got recruited out of um, undergrad. Uh, basically, everyone wanted to hire me. I didn't realize it at the time because I'd married um, an, an ISF degree in visual design and did computer science on the side and found my way to UI. Um, six months later, as I was working, my start date was September 11, 2000. I'll never forget it because a year later, we know what happened on that day. Um, six months later, after starting working, everyone was laid off. Um, so it was a very interesting time to be in San Francisco. Um, but I felt very fortunate that, I, that all of these really great, talented people went everywhere. And so I had job opportunities um, in every which way that they went. Um, ended up at Disney. And so I have been designing user experiences um, from all the travel websites at Disney, Disney Cruise Line, Disney World dot com, Disneyland.com, all of those, to then jumping ship and kind of going on the design side, um, on the design agency side, and working in mobile. So I made my home in mobile design from 2006 until 2010. Um, worked on the iPhone killer um, at the time with Nokia, IDEO, um, and Singular before it became AT&T, a project that magically kind of went away um, when Singular became AT&T and then partnered with Apple. So um, it was really interesting as a UI designer. I, um, I got to see a huge shift in the industry from before the iPhone when no one cared about UI at all to after the iPhone and with Apple's development of products where everybody was obsessed with the user interface. Um, so it's been a really amazing journey that way. Um, but there was something missing for me, um, and that really was all of these design experiences that I had worked on over the years, um, only the five years I spent at the design agency, only two of them ever made it to market. So I had the tech, I had the design, but there was something happening in the boardroom where I used to say good ideas went to die, right? They never come back on the other side. I could work, I could pull all-nighters for a project for six months and put, pour my heart and soul into the design and the technology of something, and yet that pro product would never make it to market. So I decided to go back to business school um, to really understand what I was missing. Um, so I entered Haas at two, in 2010 um, with a two-year-old um, and then proceeded to get pregnant with my second child um, while in school. And then Carla actually approached me in, 20, in 2011 to join her as a co-founder. And I thought she was crazy. Who else would want to partner with a mom of two, two young kids? But um, it ended up being one of the best decisions that we've ever made. Um, a little bit more about oh, something. Okay. Um, a little bit more about um, Kuyana. So our distribution model is very different. Um, we actually go, um, unlike most direct to consumer brands, um, we actually distribute um, by going direct to the country where mat the materials are made. So we co-locate our manufacturing um, where where the actual materials come from. So for leather, we're in Argentina, Italy, Turkey, so on and so forth. Um, but we, we scavenge the world for the, the best suppliers. Um, we're a business built with integrity, with products made with respect. So all of our products, we know our suppliers really well. They're all set to scale. They're like family. Um, we want to make sure that every product we made is um, imbued with integrity. Our products really are made with love, um, and I really feel like that's the difference. So if you ever do get to experience a Guyana product, you'll really see that the quality and the story are just the beginning, but there is something special about the design. Um, we're also one of the um, proponents of in sustainability. We were one of the first to come up with a philanthropy program that actually leveraged items that people already have. So at the heart of Guyana is a big sustainability play. Um, and I'll get into the intelligence of the business model and why that works um, a little bit later. But um, we were in 2013 when we launched the brand with Fewer Better Things. Um, we actually launched a program called the Lean Closet Program, which actually took 
items, encouraged women to donate items from their closet that they weren't wearing to give to women that actually could use them. So we partner with an organization in LA called Heart um, that helps women starting over from any situation of abuse or domestic violence. So this was very pioneering at the time when we launched our company in 2013. Um, it was the era of more is more. Um, you know, you have Warby Parker, um, Tom's, everyone making um, their philanthropy programs at the time was uh, buy one and they'll gift one. So they'll make one of cheaper quality and give it to people who may or may not need it. But that really actually um, produced a lot of waste and felt like we didn't feel like matched the fewer better message of sustainability. Um, yeah, so we're now, um, these are some of the, the early photos. I actually do this presentation for our, our company when new employees are onboarding, um, but just to always remind them that even though we're growing and we're a Series C company and we have 130 employees, that at the heart we still function like a startup and that's something that will always keep us um, fresh in the industry. The other unique thing about our business is that we've always believed in retail, so you have many direct-to-consumer brands that have um, thought that the only way, um, they've actually been quoted on record saying, um, they'd rather close their company than open a store. Um, they have since then opened stores, uh, but we actually never, um, we never believed that. We thought retail was a great way to reach our consumer, because direct-to-consumer for us is really about controlling the customer journey and giving customers exactly what they deserve. So these are some of the things that we've had in retail. Um, yeah, and then some of our office history. But let's get into more of the meat of the business model. Um, we often get asked about fundraising. We're two women of color. Um, we were raising money in 2011, um, and so many people would ask us about that process. Um, and our big, our big hope for you guys, for the men and women alike, if you guys are interested in that path, is really to, to tell you that fundraising is hard no matter who you are, whether you're a male or a female. Um, for us in 20. 11, um, you know, investors didn't really believe in inventory-led businesses. So venture capitalists, who you're going to hear from, I heard you heard from last week and you're going to hear from next week, um, they're pattern matching. And that doesn't mean that pattern matching is bad, but what they're looking for is whatever is successful in the industry at the time, if they're going to disrupt a market, they want businesses that look like that disruption. So at the time when we were pitching, they were believing in subscription and marketplaces and retailers. They didn't believe in the things that we were offering. So they didn't believe in brand building. They didn't believe in inventory. They didn't believe in a distributed supply chain. Um, so our job was to convince them otherwise. So we had launched the company in 20, we started working on the company in 2011. So when we actually raised money in 2012, we already had metrics in hand. We already knew what our cost of acquisition was. We had good estimates on lifetime value. We could show repeat purchases because we had done two collections at that time. Um, but the problem was, from a female perspective, um, it wasn't, we could never convince the male investors there was a problem. And so what we found with all of our early pitches is that we would spend the first half hour trying to convince them that even though there's a plethora of fashion brands and fashion products out there, that women weren't finding what they needed. And, and that, that whole thing would just go over their head. So we would spend half an hour trying to convince them that no, this is actually a real problem. You can't find quality. The contemporary market has really destroyed things because the quality keeps diminishing because of their constant sales. There's an overproduction, that these models aren't smart. Um, and so it took us a really long time to get to that point, and then we would lose them. Their eyes would glaze over, and you're halfway through, and you know you're not going to get the money. So I don't know whoever this person was, but um, somebody in 2012, and I hope to find this person at some point, in the early days of Pinterest, actually created a Pinterest board of every female investor in the Valley. And there were eight of them. There weren't that many. She pinned them on one board. There, wasn't artic there weren't articles in 2012 about how um, women only represented 2% of, of venture capital raised. Nobody was talking about that. Um, so there was not even any kind of consciousness about the fact that, that it was hard for women to raise money. And so whoever this person was was very uh, forward thinking. And so Carla and I, being very entrepreneurial in our mindset, and I honestly think a lot of that comes from Berkeley, like being super resourceful, because in order to even graduate from this place, you guys have to, 
You guys have to make stuff happen. Nobody makes anything easy for you. Um, that resourcefulness is what led us to like figure out, OK, how are we going to raise money? Because we're, we're not getting through to these people. So we found this list of eight women. And we changed our entire pitch and only went after those eight. And so we met female investor after female investor, some of the early ones um, at that point who now are world renowned, like Kirsten Green. We met with her when she was raising her fund for Forerunner. Um, we met with many of the people that you guys will probably hear from, Cowboy Ventures, Eileen Lee, um, every single female investor that we could get to. And we met, thankfully, early in our journey, who really matched our expectations, Maha Ibrahim at Canaan Partners. And she saw the need right away. She understood the intelligence. She believed in our team. And she ended up doing the entire round. So we didn't have to raise angel investment. Um, she was a match made in heaven. She was our consumer. She, she understood and believed in team. She empowered us to do um, what we wanted um, and always supported us when we needed it. So she was incredible. So I think that resourcefulness, like whatever you guys have to do to make stuff happen, remember as a Cal grad, like that's your biggest asset. I really think that the entire company has been that resourcefulness from um, Vicky and I were talking earlier to to landing Meghan Markle as a brand ambassador, to getting Jessica Alba as an investor. Um, all of that was that Cal Berkeley, like tap them on the shoulder, find somebody who knows somebody. Um, because being two women of color starting a fashion brand in San Francisco, nobody opened any doors for us. The Kuyana um, advantage. So what is our company and why are we different? Um, from a business perspective, um, from a marketing perspective, Fewer Better Things is, an, is amazing. And that's really what uh, launched our company in 2013. It used to take us 15 minutes to describe what Kuyana did. And once we got to the tagline and getting to that user insight, um, which really was the product of much ethnography work and understanding what the consumer needed to attack, um, to attack their aspirational sentiment of something that was an emotional need that went beyond the products they were serving. So how do you actually differentiate yourself in a very crowded fashion market? We needed to attach ourselves to an emotional need. And it really was that the consumer, especially in 2012, with the options in front of them, um, were inundated with too much stuff. And that's still the case. It's really hard to sift through all the noise as an American consumer to find the good pieces. Um, so Fear Better Things was really attached to that. But Fear Better Things makes really good business sense, too. And I think that's the part that is really compelling from an investment perspective and why, as a company, we've really grown um, and hit profitability in 2018 and have um, since then actually raised multiple rounds of funding. Um, so it comes down to four different steps. Um, in the design process, so most of the fashion or any kind of product world is very wasteful. They spend. 70% um, of their resources trying to develop into new product. So sampling, making new product is a very wasteful process and very expensive. Um, their catalog of 25%, 30% of best sellers ends up paying for all of that development process. We flipped that equation. So 70% of our catalog repeats. It's a business of best sellers that we actually only get better with with time, better with predicting um, our buys, our demand, turning over inventory, and matching um, supply to demand. So that's very intentional. So we actually design products. Newness is still part of our catalog, but we only do it um, with 25, 30% of what we're launching every season. So that's, that's really important. So a business of best sellers is much more predictable. Um, our production, so it's really great from a story perspective with heritage and meaning, and we do really um, I mean, we named the company after that. That's a very big tenant of ours. But the production side, um, it's really smart to actually co-locate your materials to where your manufacturing is, because it gives you control of how much you buy. So one of the biggest problems in the apparel and fashion industry is overproduction. And that's because these huge factories in Asia require very, very high minimum order quantities. And their lead times are very long. So 70% of what we, actually, I think it's higher than that, sorry. 90% of the revenue in fashion is only controlled by less than 10 companies. So all of us are actually competing against that last 5 to 10%. And every of these up and coming direct to consumer brands, everything that they're saying, they're actually the smallest brand in these big factories. And so they're subject to 
the lead times of whenever they can slot themselves into that production timeline, which is usually a year and a half to two years before it actually hits market. That's very wasteful. They also have to spend a lot of time actually bringing all of that material from other countries, and they have to have what they call the whole kit ready to get into the production line. If anything's missing, they lose their spot. So that, that also takes a lot of time. By us co-locating um, our suppliers where the material comes from, we were able to marry fast fashion practices like Azara and H&M with really high quality production. So our minimum order quantities are, are lower, and our lead times are, we save about six months before we can hit market. And what that allows us to do is that we can see how a product does when we launch it, see how the velocity of sale is before we place our second or third buy. So we match our inventory, um, our supply to our demand. So unlike most of the industry, that's about 60, 65% sell through, Guiana's at 91%. So that's a, that's a huge value, so we never have to put things on sale, because the sale doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the best quality. People factor that margin in, and I'll show you where. Um, the other part of Fear Better Things is that it's outstanding brand equity, right? We've attached ourselves to like an authentic identity, to an emotional need, and the product actually holds up to that. So that was also very intentional. Um, we really wanted to create a brand that people could marry. Um, and in the time, nobody was really offering that. Um, and then our unit economics. So going direct to consumer allows us to actually have a very accessible price point. We're not, um, we're not burdened by awful wholesale um, contracts, especially as a small brand. You get kind of, um, you get really taken advantage of. A lot of times the inventory gets sent back to you and you take it at a loss because the, the retailer has a guaranteed margin. So we don't have to play that game. Um, and we're actually profitable on first sale. And that's the only way that you can actually make a profitable company. So we embedded that all the way through our entire model. The gap that we're filling, um, so this is an oversized, um, an oversimplified map of the entire kind of fashion space. But if you can think of it from discount all the way to couture, um, there, around the 1980s, 1970s, um, a new market opened in the middle called Bridge. And what Bridge brands are, are the ones that are luxury brands, the cheaper version of luxury brands. So you can think of Armani Exchange, C by Chloe, so that these actually luxury brands have made cheaper knockoffs of themselves. Um, that's what happened in the 1970s, 1980s. In the 1990s, a whole new group uh, um, emerged, which is called Contemporary. So those are the coaches, the theories. Sorry, coaches a little before that, but that Coach falls in that category, the Theory, the Vinces, all of those brands fall under contemporary. And what's happened is that those brands, um, as retailers have started to fail, and even before retailers failed, um, they've made their home in products that are very repeatable, right? So there's no difference between fall collection of Vince 2018 than 2019. They look relatively the same. And so the consumer over time has basically been taught to buy those on sale. Um, Coach has detrimented their brand by having outlet stores. So over time, they've actually, um, they've lessened the value of their brand and they've had to sold, they've had to sell at lower prices. And as a result, what's happened is that they've lowered the quality. So they're still getting their margin. Um, so they've actually, um, Got, gone worse and worse in quality. Um, they have too many SKUs, their wholesale markups are too high as retailers fail, they've lessened their quality, and they never had a lot of brand authenticity to begin with, so that's the gap that we're filling. To us, um, direct-to-consumer is not an economic proposition. Direct-to-consumer, um, when we started Guyana in 2011, 2012, was not something people understood. Um, Warby Parker had just went live in 2012. Now everybody knows about direct-to-consumer brands. You hear about them all the time. Um, but most direct-to-consumer brands only talk about um, how they only change half of the supply chain. And you guys saw, um, you know, in, there's one side of it that it takes to design and manufacture and make products. And then when the products are here, you turn into a, a radically different company. You have to become a retailer. So then you actually have to market, um, do the commerce, right, do the fulfillment. Um, and Kuyana decided to do all of it. At Kuyana, we never outsourced any part of it. So um, to us, it's, 
we, we change the way we manufacture and we change the way that we sell. Um, where most direct-to-consumer companies manufacture exactly the same, they just change the way they sell. But for us, we've changed both sides of it. In fact, we went so far that we actually never even outsourced our distribution. So every Quiana box is packed and shipped by a Quiana employee. Um, so we've always had stores as part of our DNA. We've had our distribution center as part of our DNA. And what that allows us to do is to deliver the best possible cons customer experience. So to us, direct-to-consumer is about that, not about the economic proposition that says, you know, we just cut out this amount of markup. Um, we've really changed the entire, the entire gamut, the entire spectrum. And then the last part of it, um, just as a fun kind of ending slide, there was a period of time where I just, um, every photo shoot kind of made me nervous, so I, I played more of the silly role. Um, <laughs> and here's me um, picking up Carla, I would, I would do that periodically. But to us, um, our company is fewer better things. Um, you know, delivering the fewer better promise can only be achieved when great products are made by great craftsmen and delivered by great people. Shilpa is just constantly producing new things, and even though you just said it's, what is it, 30% um, yeah. of what you do is new? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can tell, if you move past the podium, oh, yeah. um, Shilpa's fairly pregnant, so yeah. she's producing <laughs> something else. So I don't know if you want to sit yeah. down and uh, we take questions, if that's, yeah. that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I know that one of the things you all wanted to do is have more time to ask questions, so we're giving you more time to ask questions. So make sure you do that. Yeah, and if you could introduce um, yourself, you just say your first name and what you're studying, if you don't mind, or what you're not studying. Hi, my name is Bryant. I'm a data science major. Um, I was curious about what you envision um, growth at Kiana to be in the future, where it's going to grow, and how you might deal with um, changes in the culture and changes in, uh, or stresses in the supply chain as you grow. Yeah, um, so growth for us um, right now, like we've been very America focused, so, um, there's still so much of the addressable market here. Um, so for us, like just actually continuing to do what we do um, at going into some new categories. So I'm actually testing some of our jewelry. It's been a lot this summer. Um, so category growth is one area. Um, further penetration into markets that we're um, not as present in. So actually the, the interesting thing about Guyana so far is an awareness play. So we've actually undermarketed ourselves. So I think there's a lot of opportunity just in that space. Um, but eventually, um, it's really easy for us to, to switch the international um, switch on. So we, we right now are not, um, sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. <coughs> sorry. Um, we're not uh, shipping competitively overseas. So at any point, um, fewer better things to me is actually a very, um, resonates tremendously with Europe, with Asia, um, the quality, especially in Asia. So there's a lot of room for us to still grow. Hi, my name, oh, sorry, that was loud. Hi, my name's Avi. I'm a second year, and I'm majoring in industrial engineering and operations research, and I'm minoring in global poverty and practice. And I just wanna say first off that you are one powerful lady. And I was very inspired by your story. And that part you mentioned about when you'd present to uh, male investors and what you'd say would kind of fly over their head really stuck with me. And I could imagine that must be frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask how you might suggest to deal with that, like maybe for other women and other POC in this audience, like who may experience similar things. Yeah, um, I think it's a really real fact. I mean, as an undergrad, um, from 96 to 2000, you know, I'd be one of, ten, you know, only 10% of my computer science classes were women, mm -hmm. right? And there was a stigma where the guys never wanted to partner with you because they thought that you were looking for a free ride or, you know, they didn't want to be in your group. Um, and so I think across your entire career, as much as I would hate to say, like I, as much as I would love to say that this is going to go away, it's not. Right? There's always going to be a disparity between men and women. You're going to walk into a room and they're going to underestimate you. I was a designer for 10 years telling developers what to build. Right? And so not only was I the woman, but I was trying to tell them 
what to, what to make. And thankfully, I had the computer science degree to call them on their, their BS when they would try to say that that would take too long, et cetera. So I, I, think, I think the main thing is, is that as women, you still have to bring it, right? And I don't think that men are inherently sexist. I don't think they want to be. Um, I think that is part of the change that we've benefited from. And so if you can just bring that data and prove to them that you're able to do it, um, they usually will relent and empower you more. In fact, because they, they find that you're checking their biases. Um, I, wish, I wish we didn't have to. Um, but I, I will say that Carla and I um, always get asked about being women, right? Like about um, every panel I get asked about certain things that I don't think a male founder would ever get asked. Um, you know, but I think as long as we're bringing it with the data and our, our work ethic every day, that they, we really leave nothing up to, to question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Austin. Uh, I'm a sof sophomore studying XM business. I wanted to ask about uh, the supply chain and the model of like Kiana. How have you guys built um, like sustainability practices into uh, the business model? Yeah, absolutely. So um, sustainability is a huge um, thing that's at the core of our company. Um, in the early days, people called it fair trade, um, making products with respect, integrity. I think now people are labeling it more sustainability. And what does sustainability even mean? Most of the people who are talking about sustainability, at, at least in the fashion world, and again, they're the, we're the second second biggest polluter post, like after petroleum, um, they're talking mostly on material and material processing, right? So they're not talking about longevity, mindset, et cetera. Um, so for us, like sustainability is part of everything we do. So from co-locating our materials to where the manufacturing is, um, we actually have a lower carbon footprint because we're not transporting materials from point A to point B. Um, by matching our, um, our supply to our demand and having higher sell-through, our minimum order quantity and our inventory buys are hugely sustainable because most, most of the waste is actually coming in, in, um, in overproduction. So I don't know. Um, there's been some articles about how luxury brands, they're starting to get called out on it. Look, sadly, they don't get called out on it enough, but Burberry recently... Um, got called out for burning inventory. So all the luxury brands actually burn excess supply. That's why they don't go on sale. So they keep the demand high by getting rid of this stuff. It doesn't mean that they, they sell everything. They actually do um, have uh, mistakes and they, they have leftover product at the end of the season. So it's terrible. So if we can actually match that better, um, we're, we're hugely sustainable. We also, um, for us, it's really about the longevity of the product, and that's where we spend most of our money. So we actually spend much more on these craftsmen because we don't have to multiply to do that wholesale markup. So all of our quality of our garments and our, our bags, et cetera, are hugely, um, they're hugely premium. Um, so our silk, for example, our mummy count is um, 26 to 28, where most of the industry is 14 to 16. So by investing more in the materiality and working with products that actually will last through the test of time, and also stylistically something that you can wear over and over again, it becomes something that women don't need as much of. And so our message of fewer better things, I mean, when we launched the company in 2013, the, the you know, TechCrunch article was like, e-commerce company wants you to buy less. Like, that's crazy, right? But now, Everyone's talking about mindful consumption and buying things with intention. Um, so all of that's really embedded in what we're doing. And then we really do our, have a circularity in our work. Um, so the Lean Closet program now is um, partnered with ThreadUp. So th you can send anything back um, through tr ThreadUp, and then they'll resell it, and everything that doesn't get resold um, goes back into recycling. So there's many, many elements along the way. Um, also empowering jobs and all these micro industries. There's, there's sustainability kind of at the core of everything we do. Um, but it is an interesting time because we've never really marketed ourselves that way. And nowadays in this environment, if you don't say you're sustainable, people assume you're not. Um, so this year we're going to come out in a bigger way to talk about the different things we are doing. Um, we launched a line of recycled cashmere recently, so 95% of it is recycled. So we're looking at things along the way to really make an impact. Um, hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm an IOR or EECS major. 
Um, and I feel like for every company that tried to start a, like a new brand in the retail space, it's very important to know what the customer needs. And mm -hmm. as you said, like women, it's hard for them to still find what they want, even though there's so many brands out yeah. there. So how do you guys realize that that is the sharp need of the customer? Um, it was actually, that's like where I get really excited and kind of obsessive about it. But um, I did a lot of user research. So uh, quantitative and qualitative. So in 2012, when we were trying to come up with the brand differentiator, um, I actually went into women's homes all the time. So just seeing how they shop, seeing the stories that they told, which pieces did they keep, which pieces did they not keep. So it was a lot of ethnography work. Um, which, which I, you know, like I can't recommend highly enough because I think a lot of times in the data, data is only as good as the story you tell to interpret it. Um, so you need to actually have that qualitative data to also marry it to the quantitative data. Um, we did a lot of surveys too to ask people what they would repeat by, um, and we heard, you know, kind of things all over and over again. We'd ask women like, "What do you find as an essential?" And it was crazy, but they they couldn't answer the question, right? Which is which is something like you would think like a pair of jeans, a pair of shoes, like it was really difficult for women to answer. So that was one big insight. The other insight was they would often say, I wish I should have bought two of something. Like they loved it so much and they couldn't get it again. And that really was a supply chain problem, right? Because when a brand actually knew they had a bestseller, they're two years away from making it again. And so they don't know if that trend is actually going to stay. Is it really going to work? But um, even though these companies, their best sellers actually pay for everything. So for Tori Birch, that Riva flat that she has pays for most of her business, right? She sells so many of those that that's actually what makes her win. Um, so taking all those insights, we realized that people were not finding value in the things that they were making. And then it became a question of like, how do you translate that into a user need that can, we can market against? Um, and we knew that our products actually fulfilled all of those things. Our quality was double what we were finding in the contemporary market at half the price, right? So if we already know that the value propositions are, it just becomes about selling it. Yeah, and like just quick follow up, how long did it take you to do all the user researches? We, um, it, the combination of user research and getting to the right fewer better tagline, we hit the whiteboard every week right, to come up with the right value proposition every week for a year and a half. Um, but the user research, like the heavy duty part was about six months. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, Silpa. Uh, good evening. Uh, and I'm so happy to see your uh, presentation. In fact, uh, one area in the entrepreneurial journey uh, I'm Gyanin Tripathi, and I'm working in Goldman School of Public Policy. Sorry, I forgot to introduce yeah. myself. Okay. Uh, one area in the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial journey is maintaining very high level of positive energy with your co-founder. Mm -hmm. And I could see from your uh, photos and the kind of deliberations you gave that you enjoy very high level of energy with your co-founder. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, we have seen that in some of the startups that issues like mm -hmm. how the equity will be decided, who will be the CEO of the company, yeah. those kind of issues are very hard issues to discuss. So I wanted to have a feedback from you because you enjoy a very positive energy on yeah. that. It, um, most startups fail because of co-founder relationships. Right, so the, it's a pretty, um, it's a really, really difficult thing. And um, you know, it, it's, they say it's like a marriage, it's so true. Because um, I, I was actually at, um, I, was at, I was speaking at the HBS retail conference in Boston just last week, and they were asking me like, what makes a startup hard? Like you know it's hard, but what is it really that makes it hard? And it's that um, lack of knowing. You don't know if your idea is flawed, if you're not pitching it well, um, you know, like you, if the product is not, a, it's a product market fit, if your partner is the wrong one, right? You're questioning everything. And you're working all the time at trying to figure out what the answer is. And when you have so many variables at once, it's just all consuming, right? And nobody's there to support you, right? I remember it took us, um, you know, like a class of 240 at Haas and like maybe 30% liked our Facebook page before our VC pitch, right? Like it's really hard to get people to actually do things. And the co-founder relationship, like in the beginning, you know, um, I thought Carla is crazy. I don't know if I would have partnered with me, right? I had a semester of school, a four-month-old and a, and a three-and-a-half-year-old, 
right? Like I didn't think I was the ideal partner. And so a lot of it was convincing her that I was actually up to par, that I was gonna work as hard as she was. Um, but I think what really has helped us, um, you know, is just really sharing the same values. Um, when we launched the company in New York, um, June of 2013, um, we had done all of the PR stuff, um, you know, kind of went to all the interviews. TechCrunch was going live June 6, 2013 at 9 a.m. And we were in New York, and we looked at each other because we were doing a whole new website, and our development team was in Ukraine. It was like 2 p.m. We finished our meetings. We were supposed to fly back to San Francisco at 4, and we knew that, that we weren't ready. The company wasn't going to launch on time. The website wasn't going to be ready. So we went back to our friend's apartment, and we sat at the same bar, the same stools, um, until 2 p.m. the next day, right? And neither one of us complained. Like, we just sat down and did what we needed to do. Um, and those kind of values of the hard work, like, whatever's important to you, making sure that those match, that in times that are hard, and they will get hard, they will always get hard, that you can always rely on those to get you through. That if you respect that person, as a person, and if there's someone that you're always learning from, that you can actually learn to, learn to live with the subjectivity of it, right? Because in those days, there's no data to prove anything, right? So every question, every problem you have, it's their subjective opinion against yours. And who wins, right? A lot of times, it's because their CEO, they decide. Is that fair? I don't know, right? So you have to, you have to basically be OK with that because you like them and you respect them. And then you realize that all of those things actually don't matter, right? That everyone's trying to do the, the best outcome. It doesn't matter who's right, because everyone's just trying to do their best. And they may be wrong. And the worst thing you could do is actually tell them that afterwards, right? Because they're making their best judgment. Um, so these are also things that we've learned. But um, I also, just some really tangible, practical advice. Um, they have counselors for, for, uh, start, for founders. You go to founder therapy. I highly recommend it. Having a coach or someone who can really break those ties and like just get you past these same recurring conversations is also really helpful. So we have an amazing coach. Mm -hmm. Hi, Shilpa. Uh, my name is James. I'm a junior studying sociology and human-centered design, uh, focusing mm -hmm. in user research. Uh, I have two questions for yeah. you. So the first is, how has your experience with interaction design helped you be intentional about designing out the user experience with Kuyana? Uh -huh. And the second is, what's one tip that you have for students who are interested in breaking into jobs with either interaction design or user research? Um, I, I use the skill sets I learned at Berkeley in those UI classes every single day. Um, so just the process of breaking down problems and trying to understand how people think. You guys don't realize how how much of a gift that is, right? So even going to business school um, with a lot of type A thinkers, they can't ideate on problems, right? And, and you're already starting at a, at a much better place because you're solving somebody else's problem. It's not the problem that you're trying to solve for yourself. And most people approach problems um, with solving the wrong thing, right? So I think, I think you're already going to have a leg up above everything with, with Guyana. Um, I was very much an anthropologist, right? I had a, a co-founder who was obsessed with fashion. I, I came from um, designing mobile phones and digital ecosystems or websites for Disney or educational tools for teachers. Like, my users changed all the time. And now I was in a fashion context. And that didn't scare me because it wasn't like I had to personally have the experience to solve that problem. I just had to understand what was going on in these these customers' problems to really design for their needs. So um, it was everything I did. I, um, you know, my uh, Carla is so few or better things that she can't even see it. Like the woman is crazy. Um, so like I would, as an anthropologist, would kind of watch her. We would take 26-hour journeys to Argentina, no sleep, three stops, and the first thing she would do is hang up her clothes. I'm like, who does that? Like, who lives that way? And so I would just watch her example after example. She never buys new hangers, just kind of in, intuitively. She, she always gets rid of something when she buys something new. Like, this is all the stuff that's ingrained in her. And I would, I would just be like, oh, like, this is what people aspire to be like, to actually have a home where everything has a purpose and a role. I don't have that. So what is it about her that other people want, too? And then you apply that to 
to seeing different women. We would, we would uh, um, sell, like, you know, man to man, right? We'd be at every festival. I sold at Art Murmur. I, I had trunk shows. And you would see the woman come to your booth, and she would, like, you know, like you rattle off about how great the Panama hat is, and it takes eight hours, and they weave it from the inside out, um, and it comes from Ecuador, and you're telling them all this stuff, not even making eye contact. She could care less, right? She's checking herself out in the mirror. Um, Looking at, looking at what she looks like, her friend comes over, and then she proceeds to rattle off everything I just said, like that, that she, and she didn't care. I knew she didn't care. And what I realized at that point, those insights is like, it's OK that she doesn't care. She's going to care second or third or fourth. So we used to sell Kuyana about where it was made and about the heritage and the origin story. And then we realized, oh, we just need to change how it's, how we, we have to actually make the message on how it's sold. Like why people buy, not why it's made, because fashion's supposed to be fun, right? And let them look good. Like make it something that they really enjoy, make it something aspirational. So when we switch the message from how it was made to how it was bought with fewer better things, that's when the company really skyrocketed. So I think that skill set and always asking those questions, like I apply it all the time. And I think, you know, if you present that in your work environment, you're going to stand out. Like a lot of the times, like you just tell them that what problem are you trying to solve and you lead meetings that way, it's, it's one of the most powerful toolkits you have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm Nick. I'm a senior majoring in IUR. I actually heard you speak uh, last what is semester. IUR? Industrial Engineering <laughs> Operations okay. Research. I didn't have that when oh. I was here. <laughs> Um, I heard you speak last semester at Off the Record oh. up in the stadium. So thanks for coming back and uh, sharing your story. Um, question I had was, you mentioned that Kuyana has a kind of a global supply chain in terms of um, different distribution networks in various countries. Yeah. How would you say uh, Kuyana is kind of being resistant to like changes in macroeconomic trends mm -hmm. due to like, I don't know, yeah. spread of infectious diseases or uh, consumer elasticity yeah. uh, in economic recessions? It is a, um, our, dis our supply chain can be a, a positive or a negative, depending on how you look at it. Um, I think for investors at the time, like you can imagine in the pitch, like you're going to go to 10 different countries, right, to all these different manufacturing. That's really scary, right, because at any point, um, like one of those countries can falter or fail. Um, so I remember when we were about to launch our, the company and our collection was in Turkey, and Turkey was having like a political crisis at the time. Um, and it put everything at risk. Like we couldn't launch because of Turkey if that supply, supply chain didn't figure out, like figure itself out. We have to exit countries often if there's a, there's a problem. But currently, we actually are very, um, we have a distributed risk, which is really, um, has been really impactful. So coronavirus is not affecting us as much because we only manufacture silk in China. Um, tariffs weren't as, as bad for us because you know, our, our supply chain's everywhere. Um, so it, it, it can be pros and cons, but for us, like, we've been largely very successful. It was really hard to find the right factories, and oftentimes we have to still exit them and find better ones. Um, so what we do now is actually we, we, co, we make sure we have two in any one country, or sometimes also if you saw on this, the supply uh, chain slide, with, um, we can do leather in Italy or in Argentina. So we also have different um, risk uh, tolerance there that we can always move products from country to country if we need to. Mm -hmm. oh. Hi, I think Hi. you're so powerful. Um, so <laughs> shout out. Um, Thank you. <laughs> my name is Den. I'm a third year here studying environmental economics and policy, but I'm also really interested in sustainability strategies and businesses. Um, so a question for you is, as Kiana is growing, how are you planning to expand? Um, and is it through locations and maybe new customer bases? And what goes into the decision making process or the thought process as to where and why and even how or whom? Yeah. Um, so I think this piggybacks on the question earlier about entering new categories, servicing new customers. Um, we always want to make products that um, are really going to resonate that we have expertise in. So we've been asked for years to do men, um, and we've we've dabbled in it a little bit. Um, but we're going to approach. I think this is really how we we come from a place of strength. We know our female consumer. 
um, we know how to design for a woman. And so the way we're going to approach men is by giving our woman things she can gift her man. Right? So like we're still playing to the consumer we know. We're not trying to represent that we know the male consumer. And as we learn the male consumer, we can expand into that category. So our goal right now is to really penetrate in the, the space we play, but then to expand that. Fewer better things, um, the great thing about that is that it's a lifestyle brand through and through. So you can imagine much other verticals, home, baby, clearly. Um, <laughs> that, that's something we know. Um, so you can go into to kids, to, to children, to home, to men. Um, we can also expand into other categories, footwear, jewelry, bottoms. Um, we've actually um, mainly started as an accessory brand and just launched Ready to Wear 2017. Um, so there's a lot of growth in just the, the verticals we're in. And then um, physical locations have really been our strength. So um, retail is not dead. It just needs to be reimagined um, and people are 70% of consumers still want to shop in store. And if you think about these direct-to-consumer brands, everyone's opening stores. Um, but we also have a leg up there because we've managed our own inventory since we've had our own distribution from day one. right? So many of these D2C brands, they were slow to get into the retail movement because they never managed their inventory before. So they're warehousing for the first time. So a lot of them say that showrooming is more efficient, and it is. But from a consumer perspective, Consumers still want to go into store and walk out with the product that they're buying, right? And the reason they can't meet that need is because they've never managed their inventory, right? So you read these stories about Allbirds store running about running out of every size because they don't know how to they don't know how to actually project, right? They don't have the data to actually do store fulfillment. So traditionally, Allbirds is a Bahama brand, but now it's the Yeah. <laughs> um, so. It, there's just these things like for us, so physical retail is one, category growth, vertical growth, um, just making sure that we have more presence in other cities. So we're at a fleet of nine stores at the end of April, so there's still more penetration there. Um, gifting is a really huge thing for us. So um, most of our crazy enough, like very authentic, loyal customer base. So we actually, um, we didn't spend on online advertising until 2016. Um, so all of our growth in the beginning was hugely organic. Um, so we weren't, we're not as susceptible to, oh, wow, the cost of acquisition for Google Ads is way high. What are we going to do? The Facebook algorithm has changed. What are we going to do? We've always been a very um, successful brand because of our loyalty and our LTV. So we still don't know the cap of our lifetime value. It's still up to the right. So there's still so many things that we can still give to her, the, the customers we already have. Um, so expanding into verticals and then eventually international. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, my name is Haven. I'm doing data science. I wanted to thank you for, uh, you know, just giving this talk. Um, so I guess more of a personal question is like, uh, I guess I came into college thinking that I wanted kids in like my early, or my mid 20s. And yeah. then now it's like I'm trying to push it back because I realize I don't have enough time for myself and finding um, time to like build a company. So I wanted to like ask, what are some like disadvantages and like advantages to having kids when you did, and um, how have you been able to like manage yeah. uh, everything at once? Um, it is part of it is ignorance. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, I've had um, I became the co-founder of Puyan at 34 years old, right? So I already had a full career. Um, before I went back to business school and before I had kids. And so in some ways, I had taken out a lot of the risk factor, right? Like, um, I got my husband through residency in medical school. I was the, the breadwinner at the time. And then when I decided to actually start my own company, I had a financial support system in play, right? So um, in some ways, waiting um, helped me. But in other ways, it was really hard because nobody really replaces a parent, father or mother. I don't think it's mother specific. And you know, like a lot of the times, the marriage at home, no one, that's what people don't tell you is that the hardest part of having children is actually the marriage, not the kids. The kids' needs are pretty simple. I'm not saying that it's not exhausting, right? But they need to be kept warm, you need to feed them. It's like pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's the, the having to negotiate all of a sudden time and responsibility, right? Like you can't just go play basketball, right? Um, my husband plays basketball Wednesdays at 9 p.m. after the kids are asleep, 
right? So like it's a different kind of negotiation. And for me, um, with work and the guilt of being a mom and an entrepreneur, I actually, for the first couple years, gave up everything else, right? So I viewed the business as my only outlet because I couldn't justify going to yoga or spending time with my own friends unless it was for the family. Um, so it took a tremendous amount of sacrifice, but I think at any point as being an entrepreneur, it's a tremendous amount of sacrifice, right? You're working. I saw Carla, who at the time had no kids and was single, she also worked 24 hours a day, right? So like I would have built-in breaks. Um, I would make her take hers, right? So like I, you know, like between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m., I'd be with them, and then I'd get back online and go to bed. I went to bed basically between 2 and 3 a.m. for seven years, right? So I'd be up with the kids, do the morning time, go to work, be home with the kids, and then get back online and work again. So it's not very different. I think the hard part is just that it's exhausting for yourself because um, you get no outlet other than what's the demands on you are constant. Um, but at no matter what time, whenever you guys have children, it's going to suck. That's the truth. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do, right? But um, it's, it's, it's going to be hard no matter what. And so you have to, it just depends at what point in your life you're going to do it. And I guess to follow up, were there any uh, like advantages to having kids at this time or just straight disadvantages? Um, yeah, it, I think the advantage is that they force you to disconnect, right? I think that was the, the best advice I got from my boss when I was pregnant with my first um, was, you're going to feel guilty all the time. That's, that's a given. So wherever you are, just be there, right? So if you're at work, be at work. If you're at home, be at home. Because the worst thing you could do as a disservice to yourself is be at home and think about work, or be at work and think about home, right? Then nobody's benefiting, right? So I think that, that part of thing, like, though it was hard, right, to like disconnect and the transition parts, like, um, you know, transitions are hard, so like getting home and then trying to be present with them was hard until I made the switch, and then after they'd go to bed, I would like stare at a wall for half an hour before I could get back online, you know? <laughs> just because it's, it's just really hard to, to roll switch all the time. Um, but it, um, it, it does, I did have to break, right? And I think what entrepreneurs do so much of is that you deprive yourself of workout time or any kind of break time because you're working all the time, and that's not going to help you either. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Oshwat. I'm a freshman here studying EECS. And um, my question for you is, I think I want to go back to a point you brought up previously about like the whole success of business comes from like the founders, co-founders like working together. And yeah. I completely agree. Um, and like something, I had a question that came up when I watched a movie called The Social Network way back when. Um, so basically it was like Zuckerberg and Eduardo Saverin like initially started Facebook, but then um, whoever Justin Timberlake played in the movie, he um, also came in. And then Zuckerberg started pairing up with him and kind of dropped Saverin. So in a sense, like he saw the other guy, I think it was Sean Parker actually, as like a better like person to work with in that sense. So necessarily, is it the fact that like when you're starting a business, is it necessarily like the fact that you have to find the perfect person to work with because it's usually only the people that you know or is it more of like no matter what happens, it's like the person you work with has to have the same mindset, the same goal and the same vision. And like no matter what happens, you work at one unit and you say like, we want to get through it together and we'll always support each other. Is that necessarily like the best way to success or is it like you need the guy with the best connection to the best networking or things like that? I think every case is different, but I do think that those, if you base your, if you base the choice of who you work with on short-term goals, right, so like network, those kinds of things, you're going to outgrow those really quickly. Like companies grow so fast, right? And even with the employees that you have, the employees that you first have, are very different than the employees you need in year two, year three, year four. And so for me, it's really about the intelligence and the hard work and the values. If they inspire you that with their problem solving, if they don't bore you, to be honest, like those things are more important because you're with them all the time, right? So they have to be um, stellar, amazing thinkers, right? So Carla's five years younger than me. She, had, she, she only had one job. Right? She was at Goldman, she went to business school, she was at Apple for six months where she mostly worked on Kuyana. And I had, at that point, like seven. Right? And so here, like, what was this young girl going to teach me? But every single day I learned something from that woman. I still do. Right? Like, um, and I think that's what was more important, is that 
Like, because the vision itself too is going to change, right? Like, I'm also like I'm I'm obsessed. I became an entrepreneur because I was obsessed with the singular idea that ideas are overrated, right? Like that that the way we teach entrepreneurship in this country is wrong. We spent 60 to 70 percent on the idea, so little time on the execution, and the execution is everything, right? Like I partnered with a girl who had a hat and two scarves. The rest of my business school class was like, "What are you doing?" Like you're gonna be a fashion co-founder. You sell two scarves and a hat, and the website looked like, like you know, like an artisanal website. Like um, Carla's dad, when she he first came and saw her selling hats at a Stanford tennis, you know, tennis match, cried. He's like, there she is. Like she went to Brown and worked at Goldman and went to Stanford, and now she's selling hats at the side of the road, right? <laughs> like, I mean, it's it's really really hard, and so you just. You just need to match to the values. I really believe that, and then the rest will come. Like you have to, you have to have someone who inspires you every day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for executing this talk so flawlessly. That was awesome. I hope you'll stay for a little while. Yeah. Thursday's 